It felt like my soul had been someplace else for a really, really long time. I entered into the eye of the storm of grief that I had been carrying. I, I began to cry. The littlest thing would just send me into an anxiety spiral at like, it's just one little thing. Why is this little thing ruining my day? Elicinia is a unique psilocybin retreat based in Mexico with a focus on meditation, neuroscience, and brain health. I had zero doubt that this was something that I was going to go through and actually do. That self-compassion sort of has trickled into every little part of my life. I hadn't laughed that hard in so long. The profoundness with which I experienced like reality, the magnitude of the beauty was just completely overwhelming. Largi, thank you so much for coming to the show. It is such an honor to have you and see you again. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and why you decided to come to Elusinia? Well, the short story is I'm a 65-year-old woman. My family has a history of depression, but I also suffered some significant trauma as a tween and early teenager that impacted me severely. And I've been looking for an answer the whole rest of my life. I was diagnosed as unipolar depression. Um, it's also quite likely I have PTSD. I've been interested in psychedelics. I did a few back in the day in the 70s when everybody was doing everything. And my psilocybin experience was absolutely delightful. I was at the Empire Strikes Back movie just myself in the, in the movie theater. I was on the ladder when Darth Vader told Luke he was his father. When I started hearing about psychedelics, I wasn't really afraid of them, although I, I had known some people that had some scary LSD trips. I followed, because of my mental health, I followed the study of humanity and our minds and our emotions all my life, pretty much looking for solutions. I've been on every kind of SSRI you can shake a stick at, and I've had a lot of therapy. None of that ever was particularly effective. The most effective thing was my husband, and then he got sick. He has Alzheimer's, and that made everything more difficult, and it made my finding some sort of solution more critical because I realized I have to be here for my daughter and for him. I could not kill myself and leave her to deal with that. That didn't feel like I could continue to live the way I was living. I was just too deep. And so I one day saw, I read Michael Pollan's book, of course. Um, I think everybody that comes to the retreat has read Michael Pollan. He's got a lot of street cred. And so once I read that, I started really focusing on what what the study of psychedelics was doing for, for the mental health academia. And Nova, PBS Nova had a really upbeat, cheerful, happy hour show about can psychedelics cure. And it was, it was all so great, except it left me feeling like, okay, well, you know, for my people your age, Tanya, or, you know, my daughter's age, and my stepkids who are in their fifties, this, this could be great for me. It's going to, I'm going to, it's going to be too late. And so I was, my takeaway was I was just pissed. And so I got, I went back and slowed down the credits and wrote down all the participants and I tracked them down and I sent them emails explaining pretty much that, that, yeah, this is great, but what do you say to people like me who have tried and tried and tried to get into these studies and were never, are never accepted. And I, I got a lot of heartfelt, naturally psyche stuff back of, you know, we're really sorry. We understand these were trials. It's not legal. We can't help you. And I, you know, I understand. And I could have been DEA, you know, trolling them. Who knows? One woman replied and said that the same sort of thing, except that she also added that while it's not legal in the United States, she works with a psychotherapist in Ecuador and they have developed a, a clinic there that she can refer patients to. And so I could have a, you know, a, a session or two online with her and then she could refer me to him. And I, so I looked at it and uh, it was a lot more than I could afford. 
I don't know. It, it just didn't appeal to me, but I had the thought, oh my gosh, a retreat, someplace that's, that might offer what I need. And so I started looking and the first, the very first place that came up was Eleusinia. And I listened, I read about it and then I listened to Ryan's story and then I booked, I, you know, I just thought I didn't care how much I, I really, at that point, I didn't care what it would have cost. I, I just, in reading it, it just sounded like a place for me. And so I talked, I had my, my interview with Jessica and I listened to Ryan's story. So that was kind of how I was when I set out for Eleusinia. And it was, there were, you know, there were people that were returning that had been there before. They were really upbeat and happy. And that first night, I, I just, I didn't have it in me to really mix with anybody. I just wanted to be somebody else. So that's kind of the short story of who I am and how I got to Eleusinia. Thank you so much. So now we're into the next morning of Macrodose Day. Let's talk about how you were feeling as you were about to ingest the psilocybin. Were you feeling hopeful then? Well, I was. And, and actually, I, you know, I, I met you right off the, the day I got there. And then I, of course, had my, my short meeting with Josefina, and I was impressed with her. The next, and, and I was by myself, so I had a roommate who was just lovely. We talked that morning before the megadose, she said, well, remember what Michael Pollan says, lean in, don't run. And so I said, yeah, that's it. So I was really, you know, I was, I was ready to confront my worst fears or be absorbed into the universe or, you know, all the things, whatever. I just wanted to be something profound. What happened was that, boy, I mean, that hit me like really fast and Jay was helping me get to a sofa thing to sit down on. And the first thing that happened was it was both, I heard it, it was oral, and I had these colors, almost aggressive colors of red and orange behind my eyes. And what I heard was, you are loved. And I couldn't handle it. I ran. I absolutely shut it down and did a fast yeet from there. <laughs> and the rest, the rest of the experience was horrific grief. Just, I think I went through three boxes of Kleenex. I just, it all poured out. And a lot of things I'd never really thought of as my fault suddenly were my fault. I mean, it, it was, it was not, it was not really very happy. And I, I remember... I was sitting in one of the hammocks and I was talking to Andrew, who was keeping an eye on me. And I said, well, it's everything I was afraid it was going to be. It's not profound. I just feel worse than I felt when I got here. And he said, well, this isn't all that happens. Let the drug do its work and see what else comes along. And so, you know, that day for me was not a good day. I'd like to come back again. And when I get the mega dose, I want to lean into that. You are loved. If I'm lucky enough to ever have that come up again, I want to know where that would go rather than <laughs> rejecting it to look at all the potential awfulness of my life. So I was, I was just really, really bummed. And Jessica came up and sat by me and we got talking and I said, well, you know, it just, it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. And she said, you know, you can take steroids, but if you don't go to the gym, they're not going to make you strong. <laughs> and for one thing, that sort of, I mean, it was amusing enough that it sort of drew me up to go, that's pretty funny, which all by itself just sort of broke my, my mood of gray, wet blanket. And then the next day we did the DMT I think that was that was the next day, and that was days got all mixed up there, Tanya. Nobody knew what day it was, <laughs> and the food was fantastic. Oh my gosh, having people just feed you and give you wonderful things to drink, and it was it was just it was hard to keep track of time. But so the DMT was nice. I felt I was like melting into the ground at one point. Well, and the the thing about the mega dose, the oh, the visuals were just phenomenal. Closing your eyes was unbelievable. And then opening your eyes, 
the mountain was moving and the ground was fascinating. The DMT wasn't quite as visually spectacular. So were Jessica and Josephina, who were holding my hand. We were on a kind of a boat swaying back and forth, and that was really, really lovely. I could have stayed there for a very long time. It was a, a really wonderful, I could get quite attached to. I think my mood was definitely lifted from that. Um, I felt better that night, definitely. We had a pretty good time that night. I think that was the first night in I don't know how many years. So the mini dose day, that was exciting, getting to get into the ice plunge. I thought we were going to do that before the mega dose. <laughs> I was kind of relieved. And we'd gotten to know each other a little bit. And, you know, it was such a, it was such a wonderful group to be with because we, everybody was really, truly supportive. And I, and I loved seeing that. Like I noticed like some of the, the men were really supportive of each other, which you don't necessarily see all the time, but being by myself. And once, you know, my, you know, my story got out kind of my struggles with a husband and the nurse in the nursing home and that kind of stuff. I, there, there was just a lot of kindness, which was really, really moving. So I was kind of disappointed I didn't go first into the the penguin plunge <laughs> because I wanted to flip my head back and go all the way under, and I wasn't. But you know, everybody, everybody cheered for everybody as we went through that, and and that dose really didn't. I mean, the mountain was fabulous, and that mountain is about probably, oh, maybe almost half the size of the mountain that was across the road from my front yard when I lived on the lake in the mountains. It, it was missing its top, but it was very special to me. And it was it was doing some really unique and lovely things on the, the mini doves. But as I was sitting there, I had, I, it just came to me that I am enough. And it wasn't somebody outside me saying, you are enough. It was from in me saying, I am enough. And then I immediately thought, wow, I'm, I'm really happy to be alive. And then I think I told you this before. My little warm voice was like, well, now let's not be quite so, you know, let's not jump on that quite so fast. You know, give it a little time to decide that one. Before that mini dose, I spent time with Josephina. And that, to be honest, that is what changed my life at Eleusinia. As I mentioned, I had trauma and one of two specific incidences and of all, in all the years of therapy I've had and in my family, knowing about this, no one, not a single human being ever asked me to describe what happened until I met Josephina. And I don't think I'd ever, I'd ever said it out loud. And once I did, it all just disappeared. It's not like the event didn't happen, but the baggage I've been dragging since I was 13 just was not right in my face on my back anymore. And then she asked after we went through that, it was it had to do with my father and she asked for his name and I did and I said it and she asked again. And I don't know what she said. I'm kind of glad I don't speak Spanish because I don't know what she said. It was either a prayer or an incantation or something. But the weight, I felt like I'd lost about 50 pounds. So I went from that into the mini dose and then had the realization that I am enough. So that was spectacular. She also made the point, and I'm still working on this, my husband's in a nursing home, and he is the love of my life. He was my business partner. Sometimes it's very, very, very hard for me to go see him and not fall apart. But he misses me. I'm not sure how much because people with Alzheimer's, advanced Alzheimer's, their sense of time is pretty limited. But he knows, I know he loves it when I'm there. So I said to, to Josefina that I, you know, I had to go and that I suffered for that, and it was a sacrifice. She, she said, well, you don't have to go. And I said, well, yeah, I do. He would miss me. And she said, but you don't have to go. You go because you love him. And because you love him, going is a celebration of him. 
And that's not suffering. I saw, I went today and he's, you know, he's definitely failed some in the last month or so, but he was very happy to see me. And I was really happy to see him and give him his back rub and his head rub and his hand rub, which is what he wants most from me. And it didn't feel like suffering. And that's because of her. And then our closing ceremony, while watching her work on the chocolate all day long, that was kind of interesting. I mean, this isn't like you go to the grocery store and here you buy some cacao and here's your, you know, your closing ceremony. This is something she spent the day on. And I think all of us who were involved were incredibly moved by it. And just overall, the care that's gone into developing how Eleusinia is run, how all you, the people, those of you who are there, who you are and how you are with the retreat attendees. I'm not sure if we're guests or patients or what, but it's not exactly your typical vacation. You know, Andrew and the breathing and the meditation and the care and everybody who, the staff, the kitchen people, obviously love to work there. They are clearly appreciated and well cared for, and I'm somebody for who that means an awful lot. So I just, I will be back. When I got home and, and talked to my, my older brother, who's, in fact, we talked about the fact that he has been frustrated over, he's 13 years older than I am, so he was 26 when all of this went down and I thought he was so old and trustworthy and I, you know, he should take care of me. And of course he was 26. Once I got to 26, I started to realize I'd been expecting an awful lot, but he admitted that he's sometimes been frustrated that I couldn't let any of this go. And I just couldn't. And now it's gone. So it's not like I came home and I'm, I'm like so much I don't think I'm unipolar depressed anymore. I don't have PTSD anymore, but I still have a life that's got issues. <laughs> you, know? you know, now I've got, now I don't have my, my usual excuse. That's gone. So I got to figure, <laughs> figure it out. But spring is coming. So it's, it's a lovely thing, but I would, I really would love to come back to El Yusinia and just be with you all again. And I, I think what I hope John Oliver had last week, his last week tonight was about psychedelics a few weeks ago. And he was talking about the potential for us screwing it up again. We had this opportunity with psychedelics again. And, you know, are we going to get to where you go to Walmart and, and buy your psychedelics? And are we just going to screw it up again? And Eleusinia has a system. I'm not fond of franchises. I almost wish they could do something like that so that this sort of method and mission is offered to other people. Because I, as a couple of people said, they heard of some other places that were kind of like hippies just getting together to take drugs. And I suppose that has its place, but it's not, certainly wouldn't have done for me what I needed. Your story's amazing because you were inspired by all the things that you had seen and you were following the research of humanity and psychedelics. And then you didn't want to let yourself get too hopeful. And your first experience, that experience of hearing I am loved, but then rejecting that and moving into grief instead, it's relatable. And it is, it does happen. Having a tremendous amount of grief and sorrow does happen, but you were able with like the whole team to find your way to the other side. I'm so grateful for you to share that entire experience. You know, we talked about intent a bit, but I think the next time I do a mega dose, my intent is going to be to refine that initial you are loved and go with it because I want to know where that was going to take me. But it may also be that I just needed to get all the all that other crap out first. I, you know, it's that I was thinking at the time I was thinking I've been crying about the same crap my whole life. What is this doing for me? But it was definitely a different intensity level. Psychocilocybin isn't just working on what we're aware of. It's working behind the scenes. And that was kind of, I don't know, one of you, maybe you, maybe Jessica, maybe Andrew, made that point of, you know, just try and enjoy yourself and let 
let the drug do its work behind the scenes. And I wasn't really able to get to the enjoying myself part very easily during that mega dose. And then, and then I slept. Oh my gosh. I, I went to bed early that night and I just slept and slept and slept. So it was, it was exhausting. And in the mini dose, I remember seeing you smile and I knew that, you know, it, it was a hard macro dose experience for you. But in the mini dose, I saw you smile and I'm so glad to hear what you found. Yeah, I did. I did smile and I, and I think I laughed and I, you know, I just, but having that, yeah, I am enough. I mean, that's kind of become my mantra. Having had that pop up so strongly in that situation. All, I mean, all I was doing was enjoying the beauty of the mountain as it moved and breathed. And out of nowhere came this affirmation, I am enough. And I, I needed that. I think we all need to know that we are, for ourselves, we are enough. And I, I think for a lot of us, and maybe it's sexist to say it, but a lot of times for an awful lot of women, we go look into somebody else to be enough. Like me with my brother when I was 13. You know, there's always should be somebody else that completes us. I, I think at 65, I'm finally able to say, no, I'm enough. That's who I am. And, and then we're, we'll see where we go from here. Have you told anybody, any of your peers, about going to Mexico and doing psychedelics? I told my daughter... And I told my brother, we both had a really detailed, in-depth conversations. But one of my neighbors, I, I think I told you, I, I ate a salad I should not have eaten at the Mexico airport. And I, oh my gosh, I was on the plane when my stomach started going bad. So the next day, I was supposed to go to work actually the next day. And I had, I had texted my daughter and said, I'm not going to be in. I need to go see your dad. I need to settle and then I was just in no shape to go anywhere. And even the, the day after that, we had a big snowstorm. And I was, it was about noon, I was in my PJs, and I looked out, and one of my neighbors was snow plowing my driveway. So I, I texted my thanks, and she said, well, you've got a little driveway. I love it. Where have you been? And I said, well, I've been to Mexico. She said, oh, that sounds so cool. What were you doing? And I, I said, well, I went on a psilocybin ring treat. And there was no reply. And so I texted back and I said, TMI. And I got a little like laugh emoji. And then later on, she texted and said, I didn't know what psilocybin was. I had to ask my kids. So then I explained a bit. And definitely I think that was to TMI because she's been waving at me, but I haven't had any further texts from her. My next predator who took care of my cat while I was gone, she was... She And she was a, a scientist. She was a, a lab scientist at the at the medical center here. And she was very interested. You know, she's just, she's just always followed science and medicine. So she was very interested. But I haven't hidden it at work. And I know a couple of people have overheard a few things. I said something about the mountain moving. And there were some chuckles. So the word that's gotten more up each foot. I'm too old to think I, I need to be ashamed of anything like that. I, I'm not really concerned. Who knows what? I, I think it's just anybody who knows me. And there are a lot of people I know. I have a lot of business acquaintances and not many friends. And I doubt those business acquaintances know that they've been dealing with someone with unipolar. But I would guess meeting me now, they would realize there's a difference in the affect of who I am. I just, I'm just different. So I like that. Well, Mark, you thank you so much. And I just hope that it continues on and, and we're here for you. And I hope to see you in some of the integration groups. I'm going to be there on Sunday. Yeah. I, I mean, you guys are just phenomenal. I am so, well, I'm not sure luck is the right word for it. I, I'm not in any traditional way religious, but I think there's a lot of serendipity in the world. And my finding Eleusinia was certainly the right thing at the right time. Because of your expectations and you were feeling that you were such a hopeless case uh, that it was too late for you and, you know, you didn't want to listen to the entire podcast because you thought it would get your hopes up. I'm wondering if you can, if you have a message for anyone out there who 
feels, you know, in the same boat that they feel like it's too late for them. Do you have anything to say to that type of person? I th I think it's not too late. And I think the message I got at El Eucenio when I was really disappointed with my, my hard, my rough megadose was this isn't, I, I was thinking after reading Mo Michael Pollan's book that it was sort of a one and done. You know, I'd take this massive dose, it would rewire my brain, and I'd sort of be who I was affect-wise before all this trauma happened to me. That didn't happen, and it was probably not realistic that it would. But I think it was Jessica who said, you know, there's, there's a lot more to this. It's not just this one thing, and you have to kind of be there for all of it and not have your expectations be, there's going to be one thing that's going to make a difference. And if it doesn't work that first time, then you're, you're done. You know, you're doomed. I just give it a try. I, I think it, it is just life is not an easy situation for many of us. Just because I'm not carrying this big load of unipolar and PTSD doesn't mean I don't have problems and that there aren't things that I would like to change about my life, but I'm, I think I'm a whole lot more competent to do that. And I think that's what we all need to look for and don't lose hope because there are people like the folks at Eleusinia who really care. The caring I got from everybody there, I, it was just more than somebody could say, oh yeah, well, I'm making a buck for this. I have to act like this, like some of my salespeople might do, you know, on occasion. So keep at it, give it a try. And I think it's a, it, it, there's a world of hope. Oh, thank you so much, Margie. You're welcome. Thank you all so much for listening. You can find all the information that you need to learn everything about this retreat on EleusiniaRetreat.com. We are a retreat that offers ongoing integration support, breathwork classes, and cultivation support after you have attended this retreat. It's an amazing experience that's one of its kind. If you're looking for a science-based retreat, something out of the box, something to change your life, something to add to your practice, this is where you really need to start, eleusiniaretreat.com.